As each of us progress through life, gathering experience and perspective, we seldom have the opportunity to recount our personal stories and impart the knowledge we've gained. Walking among us, one and all, are living legacies. Welcome to another edition of Living Legacies. I'm Tom Morrow, your host. Today we have a special two-part program. Uh, you'll see the first part that you're watching now, and the second part will be in two weeks. This is with Mr. Paul Tanner of Carlsbad. Paul was one of the original band members of the Glenn Miller Orchestra, and for 23 years was a professor at UCLA in musicology. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, you, uh, you were born in 1917? I, I don't remember, but that's right. <laughs> it was easy for me, tough for my mother. Yes, this is, and this is your 90th year. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, you were born in um, Kentucky. Whereabouts in Kentucky? Skunk Hollow, Kentucky. Skunk Hollow. Yes, well, everybody knows right, it's just right across the road from Pumpkin Ridge. Oh. Uh, Did they have the same zip code? Uh, they didn't have zip codes in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Whereabouts is uh, Skunk Hollow, or where was it? Well, not too far from uh, from Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. There's a river in between, but but uh, it's in that area. Fort Thomas is fairly close to it. Well, I I I was told that you, you went back a few years ago to. Uh, to the hometown or the to, to the home place and, and had a tough time finding it. We did because uh, we had Delaware license plates and and the, uh, those folks there weren't sure where Delaware was and or what my business. And was. they did, they were a little wary of Outlanders. That's right. <laughs> so uh, we kept asking, especially uh, elder gentlemen, where a place called Scott Connell was. We we finally found it. Pulled up to this house, and there's an old guy out there cutting his grass. And I said, Did you ever hear of a place called Skunk Hollow? And he looked at me and he laughed and walked around and said, This is it. And which one of the Tanner boys are you? <laughs> so, so he knew the family. Huh? Yeah, that was the house I was born in. Yeah, well, tell me about your parents. Uh, my dad uh, was a, an army officer in the World War One and in World War Two, mm -hmm. and uh, m my mother, being a, uh, the, the wife of a, of a of a soldier, did a lot of traveling mm -hmm. and carrying around a lot of kids mm -hmm. in those days. But they both survived. Uh, my mother lived to be ninety six. You know, and, uh, my dad was a full time army, a full time musician. A full-time educator and a full-time dad. Well, now you had a special term. You and your five brothers had a special term for your father. You didn't call him dad, did you? No, we, we called him Colonel. The Colonel. And he wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> In fact, uh, he was he was up to be uh, uh, raised in rank up to up to a general, and uh, it didn't come through because he was uh, too old. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know what we would have called him if he had been a general. You don't call the general colonel. <laughs> <you know. laughs> well, the, the, he was a provost marshal in the, in the army. Yes, he was. Yeah, and in fact, uh, he was the at one time headed was the head provost marshal in uh, Tokyo. Now, what explain to the folks back home what? The provost marshal does. What is is that kind of like a chief of police? Like the chief of police. That's mm -hmm. it, yeah. Now he was a provost marshal in Tokyo after the war. Yeah. Where did uh, where did you learn to play the trombone? At one time, um, my dad was the head of the state reformatory for Delaware mm -hmm. for boys. Now you had moved to Delaware, and we had gone from one high school to another, where my dad was superintendent. Oh, uh huh. And they ended up there in Delaware at the state reformatory. And so. Uh, now, was your dad a reserve officer? Is that how he, he kept his rank? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Okay. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Nobody ever asked me that before. <laughs> See, folks, he's very good. <laughs> uh, there were reform school kids there that could play trombone. 
And so they, they showed me how to hold the horn. And, uh, they probably could have showed you a lot of other things, too, didn't they? But you... oh, no. <laughs> how old were you at this time? Well, I stopped being around there when I was about 16. Mm -hmm. So it had to be, well, I was there for 11 years. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, I got to play in the reform school band. And I played on the reform school football team and, uh, against my own high school. You know, and I was on the right team. You know, <laughs> bunch of roughnecks. But now, but it was the kids in the reform school that taught you how to play the That's trombone. Right. They started me on it, uh -huh. you know. And then I did a lot of listening, a lot of watching, and I I, I got better in that. Mm -hmm. well, now your brothers were uh, um, musicians as well. Well, we, there were six boys in the family, and everybody wanted to be a musician. And it ended up that the three could and three couldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, professional musicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. Now, which ones uh, of your other two brothers were professional musicians? Well, the bass player and the drummer, uh, they, they have a band in Los Angeles now at the Mayfire Ballroom. They're still playing? Yeah, they have a band, a regular sized dance band there. Oh, we darn. Yeah, they but do fine. How, how often do they play? Every week. Every week at the Mayflower? Yeah. <laughs> where 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 is that in Los Angeles? It's not too far from the airport. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it's a, the biggest ballroom uh, that's operating in Los Angeles now. Oh, we are. And it's steady. Sure. Yeah. Well, now, when you were teenagers or in your in your youth, you formed a little band. Well, my brothers and I had a band. It was a regular sized band. We had to had to get in other people to make it big because there were only the four of us playing at that time. Yeah. And uh, we had a regular band. We called them the Kentuckians because four of us were born in Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. And we called and the band the Kentuckians. Now, this was on the East Coast that you yeah, were? Yeah, in Wilmington, Delaware. Mm hmm. Yeah. And really what, good time. What, uh, it was a different world then as far as music was concerned. Yeah. Everything uh, was live and not, no, no electrification. That's right. Of course, you could play on the radio. Yeah. You remember radio. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, um, my, my brothers and I had a, a good band for, for, for the area. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we enjoyed ourselves. And eventually decided we should go out into the rest of the world and see what it had to offer. Was there any money in those days? I mean, to, for band, for musicians. Well, you you uh, survived. That's about it. Well, what would it, what would you make a night on a on a gig? Well, I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell because a dollar then was different than a dollar now. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I I really wouldn't know how to place it. A dollar would buy you food for a, for a whole day, wouldn't it? Oh, more than that. Yeah. yeah. There, there are places you could get a six course meal for fifteen cents. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. 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 That uh, what kind of places did you play? Uh, ballrooms. Ballrooms. Yeah. yeah, because we play for people to dance. Well, in those days, this was before television, of course, and there was really live music entertainment like ballrooms and and the movies, and that was and radio, of course. But that was that was about it for entertainment, wasn't it? Yeah, that was it. So uh, ballrooms did pretty well, you know. Of course, my brothers and I weren't known at all, so we made enough to survive, that's about it, you know. Yeah. Who was the leader? Uh, well, my dad was for a little while, and then and eventually they, my brothers decided we should have a trombone player out front, so I, I led it for a little while. Well, now, did, did your dad know anything about music? Oh, he graduated from Cincinnati Conservatory. Did he really? Yeah, in fact, that conservatory used him as a, as a showpiece for the conservatory. He played all kinds of music, he played classical music, but he was a great ragtime player. And what did he play? Piano. Piano. Yeah. And he was really good. In fact, I, I have a, a tape of him playing. I was, when I was teaching, I, I needed a tape of a piano player playing uh, uh, ragtime. So I, I went to the colonel and said, hey, would you play something and I can tape it? And he said, uh, come back tomorrow. So I did. <laughs> And boy, he knocked the thing out like you wouldn't believe. He needed overnight practice? Yeah, to work out the kinks. Yeah, yeah. yeah but he was good. How, how old did he live to be? 
I think about 86 or so. Yeah. Had a good run. Yeah. It's, uh, he died of a stroke. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But he was a good piano player. Oh, good piano player, yeah. yeah. And a good educator. Now, did, after the Kentuckians, uh, what you... You disbanded. I mean, what? Eventually, uh, yes. rough yeah. times are just. This is during the depression. Yeah, and uh, we we stuck with it as long as we could. And then we ran out of places to stay. We decided <laughs> time to break it up. Yeah. So we did. What did you do then? The, the day we decided to break it up, we were playing in a ballroom in Georgia, and uh, Frank Daly came through to to uh, to do a one nighter. You know, the fellow who owned the Meadowbrook Ballroom in New Jersey, Frank Daly. Mm-hmm. So uh, we went to him and we figured if he heard our band and liked it, he'd put us in the Meadowbrook. We'd have it made because you're always on the air. Yeah. And if, if he didn't like it, we'd break up. So he, Frank came out and heard us play one afternoon. And he said, well, says, I'll take the trombone player. <laughs> So the rest of you can go. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's what happened. So, so I went with Frank for a little while. Went back in the, to, to the, he went into the Meadowbrook, and so I was playing with him. And they, all of a sudden, they, they found out that a, a movie actor named Buddy Rogers, you remember that name? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He decided to have a band. So many people had a band. We thought maybe Ella Roosevelt was going to have one, but she didn't. But uh, <laughs> uh, Bunny Rogers had a band, and uh, he said he wanted to buy Daly's band, but he said he had to have it like he heard it. So Frank had to, Frank Daly had to let people go that came on the band after Rogers heard it. That was me, and had to hire back some some guys. Uh-huh. So um, Daly asked me if I would stay around because he had some ideas. And um, I, I being about, oh, about 18 years old at the time, I was disgusted. I said, no. What year was this? Must have been about 36, 37. Uh-huh. Uh, so I, I said, no. And if you're in that part of the country, a musician, and you're out of work, the thing that you do is you go to Atlantic City. Mm-hmm. Because uh, there are lots of places you can sit in and play. and survive food wise and um, well Atlantic City had a reputation long before they had legal legalized gambling that's right they had gambling they had gambling <laughs> <laughs> so uh, also you, you could sit in and play or a half a dozen main bands came through there every week uh-huh. but with the two peers mm-hmm. Million Dollar and the Steel Pier so you, you go there and you, you can work in these little joints until a uh, uh, time the uh, uh, band would go through, and you hope maybe somebody would like your play and pick you up. These, these short gigs were, it was eating money. That's it, yeah. mm-hmm. and that's all. So uh, I, I was, you want to hear the rest of the story? Sure. All right. So I'm playing in this little, little joint, and uh, uh, Tom, do you, do you want to strip join this? I've heard of them. I bet you have. <laughs> the, 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 the ladies would d- disrobe mm-hmm. the entertainment of the customers. Yes. I've and, heard that's the way it works. Yes. And the musicians memorized our music in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't have to be looking at the sheet. That's oh. <laughs> right. So um, they, I, I sat in with a band, and, and they went to the owner and said, man, we sure could use this guy. Uh-huh. And the owner said, well, okay, I'll pay so much, but he's got to pay his own union dues. So um, I was sitting there playing, and all of a sudden I'd look out in the, the field of people, you know, in the club, little little club, and uh, there's Glenn Miller. And, and I recognized him because he, he, he was doing what I wanted to be able to do mm-hmm. eventually, you know. And he had a band... Uh, uh, that he was getting started with, they're, they're playing in the Million Dollar Pier. So uh, when, when we took a break, he called me over to his table, and he told me a couple of very nice things. Says, I appreciate it very much. I asked him if I could use what he said as a recommendation. And he said, well, 
how long are you going to be here? Can you come with me? And I said, right now. And I, I told him, I had my toothbrush in my pocket, and I showed him, I said, I'm packed. I was going to say, how, how soon are you leaving? <laughs> that night. <laughs> so that was, that's how you got hired by Glenn Miller? Yes. Now, did, uh, it, this was his second band that he was forming, right? He had, he had made one attempt earlier. Yes, he had. And, and in fact, he had made a few records to sort of pick up bands in New York before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he, he decided that, that he was going to try to do it this time. Mm-hmm. And he had people he would imitate, like Tommy Dorsey and, mm-hmm. and Benny Goodman and so forth. Yeah. So um, uh, he, he wanted me to come with this, this band, and I was very flat about it. Now, how many, how many people had he already hired in this second band? Were you one of the early ones that he'd hired? Well, he, he already had a band, but he's going to let some of them go. Uh-huh. And so uh, this was in 1938 in the summer. So uh, there were four of us in that band that uh, did everything the band did uh, up until they broke it up. We played every one-nighter, every radio program, every record, everything the band did. Mm-hmm. People say, well, were you with so-and-so? I said, was the band there? Because I was. Yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, All of the big hits of the late 30s and early 40s, before he went into the Army. That's right, b- before he went in the Army. Mm-hmm. So uh, there were still four of us uh, when he came out of the Army. Uh, I mean, when he went in the Army, there still four of us that had done everything. And uh, now I'm the only one left, mm-hmm. you know. Of, of that original band, you're the only one left. That's right. Yeah. Now, there are guys who, who would, come and, would, would come and go, like Ray Anthony and mm-hmm. people like this. In fact, R- R- Ray was the only guy that Glenn fired twice. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a claim to fame. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, as I said, I, uh, people ask me, they say, well, you know, uh, I saw the band so and so, or I heard such and such a record. Were you on it? Anything the band did, I did. You know? Yeah, yeah. You were in all the movies. Yeah. He made what? Three movies. He made two movies. Two movies. Uh, Orcs and Wives and Sun Valley Serenade. Uh huh. And then, in 1954, uh, they made the Glenn Miller story with Jimmy Stewart. Uh, you you were briefly in that one too, weren't you? Yes, I was. You had to. Look for me, but, but I was in it. Now, what kind of a what kind of a man was Glenn Miller? Ooh, that uh, that takes up a chapter. <laughs> uh, well, it, synopsize it for me. <laughs> all right, I'll do that. He was an excellent musician. Uh, he was an excellent businessman. He was very fair. He was very hard working. Mm-hmm. You know. So uh, he wouldn't ask you to do anything that he wouldn't do himself, that kind of thing. And he was the boss. Always he was the boss. There's no doubt about who was in charge. No doubt about it. And, and if you sat in his band, you learned a lot. Yeah. Now, did you play first uh, trombone? Glenn did. <laughs> he played first trombone, <laughs> even from out front. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, now he didn't didn't feature himself on Pretty Tunes because he knew he'd be compared to Tommy Dorsey and he'd gonna come in second. Mm-hmm. He didn't feature himself on the jazz things because he, he loved the way Tea Garden played mm-hmm. and he knew he'd come in second. Mm-hmm. But uh, you couldn't get a better lead trombone player than than Glenn was. He played with a good sound, in tune, good interpretation, very consistent, so forth. So he was a fine lead trombone player, and a lot of people don't understand that. They think because they didn't hear him play a lot of solos, that he wasn't very good. He really was good. Now there were there were a number of uh, players in the band who were quite loyal to him and stayed with him for many years. Uh, Chummy McGregor was one of them, a piano player. Uh, Chummy was one of those four I was telling you about who stayed with him until he broke it up. Yeah. And how about Bernie Swartz? Is he? Willie Schwartz. Willie Schwartz. Yes, he, he was there. Yeah, Bernie Schwartz is Tony Curtis. That's different. Yeah, that's, that's a different fellow. <laughs> different fellow, yeah. And a different lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, Willie was 
excellent uh, lead clarinet player. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, that's really he was kind of the the central figure of that Glenn Miller sound with the with the five saxes and the and the. In fact, um, people have tried to imitate that sound, and it's not the same unless you've got w w w Will Schwartz there. Uh -huh. You know, and if you have, have Will there. That's the sound that people became accustomed to. Mm -hmm. And Will was an excellent player. Yeah, I, 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 people have asked me, well, what made Glenn Miller special? And I said it was the clarinet player. Yeah, that's right. It, was, it set him apart from the other bands. Yeah, he was a young fella. We used to call him the Jersey Goopy Dowell. <laughs> um, he was an excellent player. Yeah, and all these guys are gone now. All but me. Yeah, yeah. Now, there, some guys come in later, people say, well, how about Trigger Opera? Trigger came in later. Mm -hmm. uh, how about Ray Anthony? He came in later. And, and then left and then came in again. Yes, for a while, yeah. yeah. Well, what happened when uh, when Miller, uh, he volunteered, didn't he, to go into the service? Yeah, in fact, he had to talk his way in. Was he too old? Well, he was he was above draft age, that's for sure. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, he... Uh, he had an, an eyesight problem, so the, the, the Navy said no uh -huh. on both of those counts, age and the eyes, but he talked his way into the Army. Well, now, was it his goal to, uh, to, to continue with the band? I mean, he, he had no aspirations to getting into the combat in, er, area, was it? I mean, he, his goal was to provide music for the troops? He felt one thing. Those guys are over there getting shot at, and he thought that he should take a piece of home to them. Mm -hmm. no, that's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. He he wanted nothing but to entertain the troops, mm -hmm. to take a piece of home to these guys that are over there in danger. Well, how uh, how many of the band members followed him? Well, uh, not very many, just two or three. That's all. Mm -hmm. First place, you you had to be a. Uh, he had to be in the service, mm -hmm. you know. Now I was in the service, but not like Glenn. What 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 service were you in? Army. Army. Yeah. Did you did you do any? Did you play? I mean, were you a musician? Yeah. In fact, uh, that's, that's all they did. They, uh, here I had gone to Glenn and said, "Tell him, please don't request me because I got a thing set up, you know, which would be very nice." <laughs> so he said, "Okay." He said, now you will work for me for at least a year after the war, won't you? <laughs> and he showed me the things he had contracted. I said, where do I sign? Yeah. You know? well, what did you do during the war? I mean, where uh, were you? Uh, what was this gig that you, that was, that you didn't want to get interrupted? <laughs> well, the Army wouldn't let me have that gig. After I was in, they, they started sending me to, to, to New York. And I said, but... This thing I got set up is, is in Delaware. I can't imagine the Army doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't, didn't did you tell them that, you, that your dad, that they didn't know who your dad was? No. <laughs> but they sent me to New York, and all they had me do was, was to, to play music and write music. Mm -hmm. That's all I did. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would call on the phone. I would call CBS and say, well, where am I supposed to be today? They said, well, at, at, at 2 o'clock, you're here at CBS, you know, that kind of thing. Now, Glenn went into the service in 42? Yes. So from 42 to 44 is when he had the, had the, uh, the Army Air Corps band. And a wonderful band it was. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Ray McKinley was in that band, wasn't he? Yeah, he sure was. Yeah. And uh, Glenn thought nobody could swing the band like Ray McKinley. Yeah. That was Glenn's yeah. idea. Well, we're going to pick this up in the next show. If, believe it or not, we've gone through 25 minutes. <laughs> we really, yes, we have. I sure talk a lot, don't I? No, I listen. I, I love it. I love it. And uh, I hope that you at home, uh, you folks at home are loving this as well as as much as I am. We're talking with Mr. Paul Tanner, one of the original uh, orchestra members of the Glenn Miller Orchestra from the 1930s through 1942. And we will pick this up for the second half in the next Living Legacies. Join us here on KOCT. I'm Tom Morrow, your host.